Um, so hello everyone. My name is Naomi Guzman and I'm the development manager here at the Fulbright Association. And I'm so excited to get the opportunity to chat with all of you today. I've heard so much about the important work that our chapters do. And I can't wait to talk a little bit more from a fundraising perspective of how we can expand that work. Um, so throughout today, we will be looking at four different areas. We'll start by assessing the fundraising landscape for COVID-19 and kind of talking about how things are changing and evolving. Um, section two, we'll be looking at local community fundraisers. Section three, we'll be looking at online fundraisers. And then section four, we'll kind of finish off our webinar for planning ahead for the future. Um, during today's webinar, um, I think it's important to always kind of set objectives for what I'm hoping all of you will take away from this experience. So by the end of this webinar, everyone should be able to increase their understanding of the current fundraising landscape, support chapter initiatives and local organizations, gain awareness of how to implement effective digital fundraising efforts, um, and generate fundraising ideas. So kind of a little bit of everything. Um, perfect. So beginning with the fundraising landscape, I think it's important to kind of consider the moment that we're in and really set ourselves in thinking about what our community members are going through and what changes that we've been facing over the past six months and also consider what constants are, to, are still true about the work that we're doing. So as we're looking at the changes that have been happening, especially since COVID has hit, um, people are feeling more vulnerable and uncertain overall. There is anxiety about where the economy is going. Unemploy unemployment rates are high. There are pay cuts and furloughs. People are worried about their basic needs um, and health, human rights and race relations are at the forefront of people's minds. And I think that these changes are really important to highlight because they're ones that we're all experiencing, um, but they change the way that people give their money away. They change how people engage with nonprofits and fundraisers and there is a lot of feelings of, I think, fear in our communities, but there is still a lot of excitement about the potential for the work that we want to do um, to continue to move forward. Um, so those are the changes we're looking at. Moving on to the constants, people need something to believe in. And I know this one sounds um, a little cheesy maybe, but it's true. People give to nonprofits because they want to know that organizations are working to move the missions forward that they think are important. And so if someone is a Fulbrighter or someone who believes in the Fulbright mission, working with our organization is always gonna be a good choice, whether it's a pandemic, whether they're going through personal changes in their lives. And so by being the organization that we are, we give people the security to know that even if things are in chaos, you know, our chapters are still gonna be connecting. And I think as we're asking ourselves you know, looking at businesses and looking at um, companies and saying what's going to be around after the pandemic is over, there is a security in knowing, you know, the people in the chapters at the Fulbright Association are still going to be doing this work and I can look forward to seeing them when this is over and we're in a space where, you know, it's a little bit easier to meet. Um, so that first one is very important. Our case for support has sustained relevance and all that means is that the reason we were doing this work is still a reason to be doing this work. And so the Fulbright program is still doing important work that we want to support and our chapters are still connecting Fulbrighters and kind of working on the ground to make that happen. And so although our organization doesn't do pandemic specific um, support, we are still doing support that matters regardless. Our third point um, is about the community pieces that we're seeing. I think that in times of crises, people are coming together to really uplift each other. And I think we're doing our best in our communities to really be good to each other in a cautious way. And I think that with this pandemic, you know, there has been thoughts of how we can kind of be better to the people, especially in our neighborhoods and our communities, if I can, ask a friend when I'm running out to the grocery store if they need anything, if I know that they're immunocompromised or um, if I can kind of help provide um, any sort of assistance, that's huge. So with that kind of communal, um, with that kind of communal thinking, uh, chapters are incredibly important because that work is about community. 
Um, and then the last constant that we have are that people are still continuing to be generous and donate even during these trying times. And while people are nervous about their finances, I think that we've seen that people are still making donations overall. Um, in the month of June, we can kind of see that the amount of people giving money to organizations working on racial justice issues was significant. Um, notably, the Minnesota Freedom Fund actually had to set, set their website um, and in a way that people wouldn't be able to donate anymore because they didn't have the capacity to process more donations. And so I think what that says to me is that when people believe in what you're doing and want to find a way to show up, um, there are people who have those resources or who are able to give or who will try to help in the ways that they can. And so we shouldn't count anyone out. We should be sensitive to the moment that we're in, but we should also continue to be doing the work that we're doing and encouraging people to support us. Um, so moving on to give back fundraisers. Um, COVID-19 has obviously reminded us that there are organizations working in direct service right now that need a lot of support. And I think it's natural for chapters to consider um, if they want to be fundraising to give money to uh, a, sh a homeless shelter or a food bank or another organization working with people internationally. Um, and so in that spirit, Give back fundraisers are how we work together to kind of cultivate funds for causes that have a similar, maybe not a similar mission, but are kind of just good to be supporting during this time. And so if your chapter is considering doing a give back fundraiser where they're gonna raise money for a local food shelter or local homeless shelter, for example, um, there are a few questions we kind of encourage everyone to consider, um, which is, to help us determine which organizations and causes to partner with or to kind of be in support of. Um, so uh, asking yourself, do the organization's values align with us more generally? Um, does this cause create more understanding or peace as we're thinking about the Fulbright mission? And is this support timely? Um, so I think especially right now as we're seeing those direct service organizations having that need for support, it's incredibly timely. Um, but obviously there might be other organizations that don't necessarily have the same need for support during this time. Um, so picking an organization where they're really helping people who are impacted by the issues that are impacting our globe um, is really critical right now. So I think these three guiding questions can kind of give you a sense as you try to pick out if you wanna do a give back fundraiser and raise money for other organizations. So when we're looking at supporting other organizations who are doing meaningful work during this time. Um, there are three different ways we can go about doing that work. Um, there can be a drive of food or clothing where you're collecting resources to kind of pass along. There is no shortage of people who need resources at this time. So whether it's donating old clothes or you know, donating cans of food, there are a lot of people experiencing homelessness currently. And so doing a drive is incredibly effective during this time if you're able to get the materials together. Another way you can support other organizations is to do your own fundraiser, kind of trying to raise financial support for other organizations as well. Um, and I think that it's important to know that while you can't, aren't able to use the funds from your Fulbright grant to donate to another organization, you are definitely still able to raise funds for another organization from your chapter. And, and to talk meaningfully about that partnership. Um, and then the last thing you can volunteer and give your time, even though I think a lot of the traditional things we think for volunteers are a little bit more challenging when things are remote, there are still organizations that need people, you know, phone banking or might have other tasks that they've been able to adapt to have a remote component. Um, so there's definitely a variety of ways we're still able to give our time as we're trying to think about meaningful ways to support organizations, especially those in direct service. Okay, um, so moving on to the digital fundraising piece. As we are all kind of social distancing and trying to make the most of the time that we're in, digital fundraising is more important now than ever. And it's a critical tool that we learn how to harness and use to ask for money and connect with other people during these times. Um, so there are a few different ways that we can 
do digital fundraising. Um, there's virtual events, which is something that I've seen a lot of people kind of thinking about as they've had to cancel events for this year. And so you're basically just creating a digital space for individuals to come together. I think we saw a lot of Zoom parties and a lot of people, you know, having Zoom meetings for work, uh, especially over the past couple months. And so taking that model and having a program where maybe you have a speaker do something remotely and you encourage people to come and you use that virtual event to encourage people to donate um, is one way that you could do digital fundraising. Um, another way is by writing a persuasive email. And so all you're doing there is writing a well-written letter to explain to people, you know, the Minnesota chapter really needs your support during this time. And here's what we plan to do with the money that we're raising. So really showing to people that, um, that there's still relevancy for them to give you your, to, to donate to your chapter and to give that money. Um, sometimes people just don't know that you also have um, programs and things you want to move forward during this time. So kind of having your case for support ready for that can be really critical. Social media is a big way that most digital fundraising is done. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more extensively later. Um, but you can post a series of posts where you kind of talk about why people should consider supporting you um, and using that to tell a story about your chapter and kind of how you got to this place of asking for money and why now is an important time. And the last one is crowdfunding. Um, it's become very popular, I would say, over the last maybe at least five years where we see sites of there's kind of a timely appeal and you're asking your community to help you raise a goal. The focus is maybe someone needs surgery and the surgery costs $10,000. So there's a crowdfunding page where people are asking their community members to step in and help an individual. I've seen people do crowdfunding for student loans. I think you see crowdfunding for all sorts of kinds of support, whether it's, um, you know, I saw families in the foster care system needing financial support to help them get through their casework. And I think that it's not so much about any utilizing any one of these tools specifically, but just knowing that they're all tools that you have in your tool belt and that depending on what you want to support and what your chapter is doing, you can kind of find one that's going to fit your needs the best. So as we're thinking about digital fundraising, um, we're also thinking about how you tailor your messaging if you are going to do a more traditional fundraising appeal where you're pleading your case and asking people to give funds. So you want to consider where you're posting and what content makes the most sense for which platform. And so I've included just a few of the popular social media platforms so we can talk about the differences between how you think about developing a fundraising campaign for each. Um, so starting with Facebook, Facebook is a place where people are friends. And in that sense, people are looking for connection and community. They're looking to have groups where they're in conversation with each other. And so the kind of appeals you wanna make on Facebook are about supporting our community. They're about coming together. They're about serving a need. And I think that the nice thing about Facebook is you have people in discussion with each other in a way that you don't on other social media platforms. Um, so if you're looking to kind of bring in that community tie, Facebook is a great place. Instagram is another option. Its focus is on aesthetically pleasing images and kind of an aspirational lifestyle. And I think in that way, people sometimes see it as less of a fundraising tool than you might think of Facebook being. But Instagram is also great because it gives you the chance to give smaller snippets, kind of bite-sized tastes of what you're talking about. And if you're using the two platforms in conjunction with each other, people can kind of see a snippet and then check out the longer story on, on Instagram or over email. Um, Twitter is content that is short, it's clever often, and it's um, to provide commentary. I think that fundraising can be a little challenging on Twitter, but it can be, once again, another great place to boost the content that you're already posting and get it to an audience that might not be on other platforms. LinkedIn is very buttoned up and professional. It's for sharing facts and ideas. You're trying to connect in a way, but it's less about being emotional and more about being professional. And so a fundraising appeal on LinkedIn, I would think would be incredibly facts-based. It would be rooted in numbers. 
And you're honestly a lot less likely to see them in other platforms because LinkedIn is a place where people go to be professional, um, not necessarily a place they go to connect and discuss um, more casually. And then the last option is email, where messages are long, they're personal, they might include some graphics, but ultimately you're not gonna send a lot of email appeals. So you're limited to sending one, maybe two email appeals about a given fundraiser. And in that format, you have a lot of time to talk about your case and to talk about the work that you're doing and what you'll be doing with the funds, but you don't have the same potential for as many people to kind of re-engage with that information because you're only making one post when you send an email. You're only sending a limited amount of emails, whereas with any of the other social media platforms, you can make a larger amount of posts. So I think over email, you're gonna be more thoughtful, you're gonna be more thorough, but you're gonna be less frequent. Um, these platforms are ones that I've used all of them to fundraise. I think you're best when you're using a combination of them and when you're really figuring out, is this something where I want to appeal to people more intellectually or do I want to be pulling their heartstrings, especially during this time? And I think a light combination of both is always important. Um, but ultimately, you know, you also have to know where your audience is. If you don't have many people who are engaging on Instagram, then it's not going to be a good place to be asking for money. Or if you have a ton of Facebook followers, that might be a better platform or considering, you know, those spaces where people are really not only following you or liking you, but are actually engaging with the stuff that you're bringing to the table. Um, and the last thing I wanted to note is that fundraising in terms of appealing for money cannot be done on the Fulbrighter app. Um, which is why we haven't been able to utilize it either. It has a lot of great features to allow Fulbrighters to connect, but unfortunately, to really put the focus on that connection, fundraising isn't a thing that can be done there. Um, but event promotion is, so you can talk more about the events that you're having or the things that you're doing while you might not be able to, you know, share a fundraiser you're doing online or, or post anything there about that. Okay. So let's say that you've decided you wanna do some version of a social media or an email fundraising campaign. You've decided you're gonna post something on Facebook, Instagram, and then you're gonna send out an email. You wanna start by working on creating a theme for your overall fundraising campaign. So you want everything to feel like it was done intentionally, like it's planned and the posts are personal and they're kind of building on each other. Um, so asking yourself, why are you raising money in the first place? And that might be, you know, we're raising money to bring a particular speaker to town, or we're raising money to give back to a certain organization. Knowing why you're raising money is going to be critical to how you set up your theme and your messaging. Um, and then also knowing, is this, like I said, for a specific one time purpose, or are you just raising funds more generally to sustain the work that your chapter is doing. And that is also an option to just say, our chapter does great work, come check it out, feel free to make a donation and not know that you're gonna be raising money to bring X, Y, Z person. Um, and so it's important to remember that fundraising can make up for your general funds as well as um, your more targeted ones. So you also wanna ask yourself from the perspective of the people who will be looking at your content, why is now an important time for them to donate? Is there something timely that's happening right now? Is there something timely that's happening in the world, in your organization, in the lives of the people who support you? Maybe if, you know, in a particular state or community, there might be discussions that are happening. That's a great time to kind of rally around those more personal discussions as the people you're gonna be asking to support you might be Fulbrighters in your area, it might be chapter members, it might be, college professors in your town. Um, it could be any combination of people who feel passionate about the mission of Fulbright. So things that are really impacting your area are gonna be even more important as you're thinking about the messaging of your theme. Um, and then lastly, you also wanna ask, are there fundraising campaigns that are already happening that you can participate in? Um, so an example of this for us is Giving Tuesday Now happened on May 5th, and Shaz kind of brought that into our orbit and told us, you know, this seems like a really awesome idea, we should be a part of this. And it was a fundraiser that Giving Tuesday, the 
organization had had set up and said, you know, use our hashtags, be part of this movement. It's a thing that we're encouraging a lot of people to participate in. And so our theme was to participate in this, um, but we also had more specific appeals that spoke to the work of our organization. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the original Giving Tuesday that happens kind of after Black Friday, right before um, Christmas, but when you have something that's been established by another organization that has a little more credibility, sometimes people are more likely to be in the mindset of already thinking that they should be thinking about giving. Um, another thing I would always encourage is to share personal stories. When you're talking to the people in your network, uh, they want to relate to you, they want to get to know you, they want to know why it's important for them to be engaging with your organization. And so do you have people who can share a testimonial about being in your chapter, the work it's done, how it's impacted them? Um, and do you have stories that can illuminate how a donor's contribution has ultimately helped you get something done? So these stories are huge. They're a great fundraising tool. They really allow people to see, oh, if I give my money to this, to this chapter, they're gonna know what to do with it. And I think that our chapters are already doing such amazing work that sometimes it's just knowing how to showcase it the right way so that people can understand what's happening. Um, and then the last one is to set goals to increase support. So crowdfunding is distinctively known for this, but setting a goal at the beginning of your fundraiser to say, you know, today we want to raise $10,000 or today we want to raise $2,000 to bring the speaker to town or we want to raise $1,000 to donate to this organization can really let your donors know and your supporters know that you know your community and you're not just raising money to raise money, but you're raising money respecting who they are. You have a goal in mind, you know your community. And considering how you come up with that number can, can be kind of tricky, um, but it's helpful to really think about how much money do we need to do the thing we wanna get done? Or how much money do we think we can realistically ask our community members to bring us in support? And so setting a goal that's too big can ultimately backfire because sometimes it makes us look silly. Um, if we say we're going to raise, you know, a million dollars today and, and we don't know what that million dollars is for and we haven't really taken the time to cultivate a community of people who would be able to give us that money when we ultimately raise $15, um, people are going to wonder why we put this outlandish goal out there. So I, I tend to go a little more modest, but on the other end, you don't want to reach your goal so early that people don't feel like you really need the money. Um, so for example, for Giving Tuesday, we kind of um, went back and forth with what we wanted our goal to be. Um, but ultimately we said it's more important to use this first fundraiser as a moment to kind of wait and see what our community is, um, kind of how they're responding to our digital fundraising efforts. And then we can use this, what we've raised in past years to kind of inform what we hope to raise in future Giving Tuesdays. Um, so putting a lot of energy into thinking about that goal really will pay off when motivating donors to give. Okay. Um, so the last um, section we're talking about is planning ahead for the future. Um, there are so many fundraising techniques that we can use when we are able to be with each other, when we are able to be together in person that we are not able to utilize in this moment, but because we do have this extended moment at home, it gives us the ability to really sit and consider what do we want to start to set up so that when we're able to be with each other, we can kind of have things ready to go and so they can move more quickly. And so this is just talking about fundraising ideas that are potentially gonna be in play past COVID-19 and acknowledging that just because now is not a time we're able to use them that they haven't fallen out as tools that we can utilize. So the first of those is sponsorships, which is partnering with local institution and businesses. And even though it's harder to get a sponsorship right now, it definitely doesn't mean that it's not a tool that you can use in your current fundraising efforts. I've also seen people adapt a sponsorship to maybe just say like, if we're partnering with you know a local pizza shop, maybe they can give a discount to everyone who calls in with our are um, giving them a specific code. And so in that sense, it's not quite a partnership or it's not quite a sponsorship, 
um, but it's mutually beneficial to you and the local business, as well as your community members who might be attending your virtual event. But with in-person partnerships that are looking at sponsorships, uh, there are so many different ways we can think about how to solicit those. Thinking about the places that you're a patron of, thinking about the places that you know, thinking about the places that you work, it's kind of, there's so many different ways we can get involved with that. So I always encourage people to think about where you buy your coffee every day, or where you bank, um, maybe even where you get health insurance from. It's, it's really important to think about the places that you're a patron of and then use that patronage to kind of open a wider discussion about your in-person or virtual event and consider a sponsorship. So that is also an option. In events, um, this is providing programming or a speaker. And so while you can still do virtual events, obviously it's a lot different seeing someone over Zoom than it is in real time. And so a lot of events, I think, I'm hoping as things eventually come back that we're able to see events come back as a full fundraising tool because there's so much more that goes into an event than just you know the speaker and everyone on Zoom, there's kind of the ambiance of being together with each other, which I know is something a lot of us miss. And so I encourage whenever anyone has any kind of event, educational um, or you know a luncheon to add a fundraising ask at the end, I think it can be really powerful to say, we're all here, we're all plugged into this moment. How do we feel about giving a little bit of our money to support this moment? and to support you know the great things we just heard about from our speaker tonight or you know to consider the organizations that have needs that we want to raise money for so events will be coming back but even virtual events have these components um, and then also partnerships partnerships with other chapters um, we've seen a little bit of that in the past and then you know just making that effort to think about who are other people in your area or other organizations in your area that care about things that are on um, kind of in the same portfolio of the Fulbright mission. Who else cares about international work, international understanding, who would be interested in doing that kind of work alongside a Fulbright chapter, who's doing stuff more locally as well. So I think partnerships can be really powerful, whether they are between chapters or they're between organizations or they're between universities and chapters. There are so many different ways we can be better together. Um, and then the last tips for success that I would give you are just to pay attention to the strategies that you like. So we're watching other people make fundraising appeals and we're really just seeing that there are so many different ways that people do fundraisers. I've seen doing 24 hours of gratitude or 24 hours of thank you. We've seen making videos, things that are silly, things that are professional. There are so many creative ways that people are fundraising. And so if there's something in particular that you like, paying attention to that and just making a note of it will really help you when you're starting to think about the fundraisers you wanna do. So for example, if a fundraiser has videos where all the staff members kind of speak about what they do, you might say, oh, I really like the way I got to meet and hear from you know all of the people at that organization. I'd love it if we could have our whole chapter board introduce themselves over video and kind of appeal to our community more directly. Um, another option is you might say, you know, I really liked that thankathon where they talked to their community and said why they were grateful. I would love for my community to hear about why Fulbright is grateful to be in partnership with them. So those are some examples, but I'm sure that all of you have your own tastes and interests. And so there's going to be fundraisers and things that you see that resonate with you and really paying attention to how you can rework some of that to be applicable to you is going to be really helpful. Um, just as I see so many people in the fundraising world sharing best practices and ideas and bouncing off of each other, we can do that as consumers of this content. Um, and then consider the changes in the landscape that we spoke about. I think when we can come to people acknowledging the place that they're in, whether it's, you know, potentially having lost a job or potentially worried about, you know, the housing crisis, whatever it is, not necessarily saying, I know you have money, you should give it to me, or not necessarily saying, you know, why wouldn't you give right now, but really acknowledging, I know, I know now is a tough time for a lot of us and anything you can give would mean a lot to me. Anything you can give would mean a lot to our Fulbright chapter. 
keeping that perspective and having that perspective is going to go a long way with the people that you're working with and just kind of leading with that compassion and starting by acknowledging how much people have meant you in the past and how much you really hope they'll continue their support into the future, whether it's financial or in partnership. Um, and then the last thing is to raise excitement um, by teasing future fundraising initiatives. So even if you don't have all the pieces, um, you can always give people clues and kind of talk to them on social media about what your next fundraiser is going to be about or what your next event is going to be about. And I think right now reminiscing on what we've done in the past is so important and also having something to be excited about for the future is really important. And so people who might not normally engage with kind of guessing about what you're doing or being excited might be more in that headspace simply because of how plugged in we all are to the online sphere and to each other in these moments. Um, so those are some of my tips for success. Does anyone have any questions? So it looks like there's a question. Yeah. Oh. Go ahead, whoever was about to ask a question. That was Jim from the Kentucky chapter just pointing out that I think we had one show up there in the chat box. Yep, the question says, are events now fundraising initiatives or are they simply fair game for fundraising moments to arise? Um, so I think that this question is referring to event that your chapter does has to be a fundraising event. Um, but yes, I think the answer to the question, is it fair game to do fundraising? It is um, just noted that with, if there, if there, if you're using any grant funds for your event, those funds cannot be used to do fundraising. So that's kind of an important distinction that we also need to make. Um, we just, the stipulations of the grant don't allow us to use government funds to make money. Um, but if you're holding your own event um, using chapter funds, you can definitely be creative and think of ways that you can bring in money for your own chapter. I know that some chapters have talked about maybe doing a mask sale or something else, and those would all be, be great ideas to do um, chapter fundraising. So I, I'll, I'll just add to that statement of Lisa's. Um, if you have a current event that's going on, you can make an announcement that, oh, please support the work we do in the local community. If any of you are interested in donating, uh, you, you can talk to one of our board members here. You can make such announcements within your events, irrespective of where they're funded, if that's the if it's just um, an announcement, uh, but you, you can't organize an event from government funds in order to raise funds is, 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 is the point. Um, and, and I think Naomi also stressed on the um, importance of not using the Fulbright app uh, for uh, asking for money. That's another very important uh, distinction and something for you all to remember that you cannot use your space on the app to solicit funds. You can sell tickets for events because it's, it's, um, there is a huge community of users on the app. There are commissions, um, embassy post alums. Um, you, you just have to be very careful that who might see your post. So other than that venue, you can use announcements at current events, emails, your social media, your website to say, consider donating. And the other thing we do at the FA is a lot of members want to donate to their local chapter. So you can have big donors, if you do have in your community, send us a check, which we in, in turn send back to you, or you could just keep the check, but let us know because we issue the uh, tax exemption letter. Chapters cannot issue that for federal purposes, for tax purposes. We can do it on your behalf. I also received another question that says, do chapters have a fundraiser, any favorite fundraisers? Um, which I would love to hear if there's anyone in this uh, webinar who's done a fundraiser that 
worked well. And I know we do have Nan here and Nan did a great fundraiser. I believe it was now, was it last summer, I think, um, where she rode her bike across the U.S. and raised money for Fulbright along the way. So that was like a really fun and creative way that they, um, the Utah chapter is lucky to have Nan who's into riding her bike and she creatively used <laughs> her hobby and passion to help raise money for the Fulbright Association. I don't know, Nan, if you have anything you want to add, but I welcome anyone else's comments. Yeah. Can you hear me or should I do a chat? We can hear you. Okay. Uh, one thing that I wish I had done even more of was meeting with various chapters all through the U.S. Um, and I know Lisa helped set this up and lots of, lots of you helped. Shaz helped. And um, that that could, you know, that helped unify the whole mission of Fulbright, for me anyway. Um, people were coming together, they were having little events based on the bike ride, you know, so they'd all meet in a pub and I would be there trying to stay awake <laughs> at the end of the day. But um, that could lead to further fundraising, I think, where people feel the chapters are feeling connected with each other. And I wasn't aware of how powerful that can be. Um, when I went to the national conference in October, all these people came up and said, oh yeah, we all gave money for Fulbright through your bike ride. So, uh, Things like that have more impact than you realize. And you, uh, we, we are about to uh, mail our annual report for 2019. Um, you will be pleased to see that there's a whole section dedicated to Nan and her bike ride and her fundraising on behalf of the association, as well as lists the names of the donors. Oh, good. Honoring good. the donors. So you'll see that. I'm giving you sneak uh, sneak review of it, but <laughs> the way we can, you know, honor all the donors in our community. But I mean, you could use a cause like Nan has used her cause to fundraise for national. You could use similar models for fundraising for your local food bank or, you know, for a cause in your community or for chapter. It's easier to find support for a cause, um, you know, that, the, and, and that might be something the chapters might want to do. The other thing Naomi touched base, uh, touched uh, on was the uh, uh, connecting with other chapters for fundraisers. Now, the, this it can really work for chapters like the New York, Greater New York one and New Jersey one, uh, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, uh, Massachusetts chapter there, you know, the, the um, Connected uh, the space, the geography allows you to actually have participants from both chapters participate in a joint event. So that's something other chapters could also look at and model on. Yeah, good idea. Yeah. Are there any other questions or does anyone else have a, a fundraiser they did with their chapter or maybe an idea you have for a fundraiser that you want to share or, or talk about? Hi, this is Bob Shaw from Rhode Island. Can you hear me? Hey, hey Bob. <laughs> Hi, Nan. I, I actually uh, have fond memories of working with Nan back in Utah. But um, so, um, we haven't really focused on fundraising in our chapter. Is that intended to be a, a, a key requirement now of our chapters? It's not a key requirement. We um, historically, the association has tried to keep the fundraising at the national level. Uh, mm -hmm. Chapters had other sources of revenue as well as other community engagement opportunities, but we have been listening over the years to chapters, and it seems that we need to allow our chapters to strengthen as an independent, even though you are affiliates of the Fulbright Association, but independent in some ways, 
to be able to do things that you can't do with the grant funding or right. restrictive sources of funding. And it, there is precedence, like there is a donor in our DC area, Virginia, that donates to the national area, a capital area chapter. Um, so what, what, what he does is sends us the check and it's a sizable amount. It ranges from 2000 to $8,000 that he's donated. And that's extra from what he donates to us uh, annually. So we, I mean, that's money that, you know, you don't know who's in your community. You might have a, a member who has access to extra funds that could help the chapter do things that are not restricted, right? It, meaning you, if you want to buy a iPad for your chapter to have at events to help people register, sign up for things, you know, and a lot of chap, uh, NCAC does that. And uh, a couple of other chapters have that iPad. Now the chapter grant restricts you from buying equipment, buying, um, paying for alcohol, you know, little, little things like these that can be empowering to the chapter to expand membership is what we are trying to sort of help. There is no compulsion. There's no mandate. It is only here are new tools. If they can help you get your chapter to the level of more engagement in the community and more independent with, uh, with um, funds. I hope that we have some chapter. Okay. Good. Thanks. Any other questions? I have a suggestion, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so, uh, and Naomi can build on the point I'm about to make. Um, one of the more successful ways that you can fundraise is to host a small gathering. Now, this is normally, under normal circumstances, this would be like a potluck dinner at your home. Um, where you might uh, uh, have a, a, a topic of discussion, or you might invite a local Fulbrighter uh, to come and talk about his or her experience in the United States, something like that. Uh, this can be done virtually within your own community and your own chapter. And then what you can ask people to do is in, in lieu of what they would have spent that evening on dinner or a movie or uh, something like that, to contribute $30, $40 to the chapter. Um, and uh, you can talk about what you might do with that money. Um, Shaz is exactly right. The, the fact is this is unrestricted funding, allowing you to do all kinds of fun and interesting programming. But the point is that gatherings can be done uh, virtually, and then you can do an ask. Um, Naomi, I don't know if you want to build on that. Um, yeah, no, I think you're just um, echoing the same sentiments that I had earlier. I think that um, looking at all of the tools that you have, thinking about all the different ways you can fundraising, and then considering what works best for, you know, the city or town you're in, and what also makes the most sense for the community you have is going to be is going to be the best and only you all are the experts on your given communities so we're just giving you some suggestions and uh, feel free to take what works and leave what doesn't um, i'm going to add something to what john just said um, many uh, as you know many of you are old timers like me we've been with this chapter community for a long time um, and many of you used to have events if you recall um, small gatherings in your house where you had someone speak about a topic, just like John said, and have a dinner. Um, it would be in some cases you guys have hosted uh, occasional uh, uh, scholars from the occasional lecture fund. You brought in scholars from other uh, universities or they happened to be in that town that they were able to engage with your chapter members. Um, the pandemic is, has created a big problem about in-person gatherings, as you all know. But this is a good time for you to use the Fulbright Forum platform to have a speaker of interest to, um, to members. And you don't have to have everyone there. You could say 10 people 
and you know have a talk sort of a sit down dinner where you can practice outdoor dinner where you can practice social distancing at the same time have a speaker and it's similar to the model we already have in the salons that we do we have a speaker we have 20 to 30 people uh, when things were normal uh, in a room and the topic uh, the speaker speaks on something important, be it what is happening in the polls or uh, public policy or international education, anything of interest. It could be a former ambassador who happens to be living in your, in your city um, that is retired. Anyone like that, you could create really niche programming on and use the name Fulbright Forum, uh, you know, and have a gathering um other than you know international students uh and visiting fulbrighters because uh frankly um i don't know what the state department is going to do with the grant we are yet to hear on the grant then we are also uh not sure about which countries are going to send their visiting fulbrighters to the united states because we are a country right now uh as you know, the news rated as high risk for the uh, virus. Um, and so people don't want to send uh, their students here and their scholars. There's a lot of talk uh, about virtual uh, education, virtual um, schools, but there's a possibility you won't be dealing with a new co uh, cohort of visiting Fulbrighters. Um, so there's, it's very, and it's also a very important time for you to think about engaging alumni, which is a big push by the State Department as well, that collectively, what's the power of the chapter, what's the power of leadership, and then utilize some of these resources that we have shared through this fundraising uh, webinar. What are the resources that you can tap to create the change you want and do the progress, um, the creative, innovative programming in your local communities. I hope that's helpful.